Hey everybody, welcome back to Northern Land Plays of Binding of Isaac Atrath Plus. Quietly put together a nice little streak, had to play, whoa, scary. Had to play reasonably well in our last episode to get through a little bit of dangerous sauce around the womb. Phrasing. 2CX3, 9X66. Uh, very simple, 480. <laughs> Wait a minute. That doesn't sound right. Well, 9 times 60 is 450. 9 times 6 is 45. It's actually 495 NL. Hold on. Then you go to the old calculator. You go 9 times 66. 594! I've really lost my touch. <laughs> you know? Oh, that's right. Because it's not 450. It's 540. I've made myself look like a fool. By breaking the number one rule of commentary, look, uh, do a math. You should never do math while playing a video game. All I can say, well, unless you gotta do it in order to, you know, slay the Spire style, but, uh, all I can say is my level of arithmetic. I would definitely put myself, when not speaking and also playing The Binding of Isaac, at an above average level of acumen. Above average for, er, for adults. I cannot compete if you are a recently graduated middle school student. You're probably quicker on the draw with multiplication than me. And don't even get me started on division. But a lot of adults don't even know how to tip. It's crazy. They can't do the math in their heads for how to tip. It's very simple. If you want 10% just to get a baseline, you look at the uh, bill, let's say it's $20. You move the decimal point one to the left, you got a $2 bill. Now you that's your tip, you cut it in half, there's your tip, $1. 5%, I'm joking, I'm just... I like to get the tip debate started because it, it frustrates all people. If you say you tip badly, which I do not, just for the record. If you say you tip badly, Anyone who tips well or has ever worked in a position of uh, service will be very upset with you. And with good reason to some extent. You know? Waiters, waitresses, sometimes bartenders, they get paid, uh, you know, below minimum wage in a lot of parts of the world and are expected to have that income subsidized with tips. Now, is it the diner's fault? that minimum wage is that low? No, but at the same time, if you're a diner and you take issue with service staff minimum wage being so low, the way to protest that is not to give them a bad tip. The way to protest that is to, you know, write a letter to your governor or whatever, instead of just being smarmy and being like, well, here's a tip, get a different job. That's not helpful for anybody, okay? That just makes you look like a dang jerk. We're going for it here. At the same time, I will also say, I've heard stories about, uh, and I don't know the validity, but I've heard stories where they're like, you know, if you work at a place where food and drinks are pretty expensive, you get cash tips, how much of that actually ends up being declared on your income tax returns. I'm not trying to say none of it. I'm not trying to say all of it. I'm just, I'm just saying. But at the same time, you know, whenever there's always in ever in every discussion about tipping, there's always somebody who's like, my uncle used to work at a steakhouse, and routinely people leaving the steakhouse at the end of the night, waiters and waitresses waitresses would have gotten four or five hundred dollars in tips. First off, so what? But secondly, you know, if people are paying two hundred bucks for dinner for two, and they're leaving a, a forty dollar tip, yeah, you can see how it would add up pretty quickly who's to say they don't uh, you know they haven't earned it by having to deal with people being like well my medium rare steak is actually cooked closer to a rare than to a medium rare which is also fair to complain about I would suggest if you're paying a hundred dollars for your steak but anyway regardless it always reminds me whenever there's like a discussion about homelessness in Vancouver always a very prickly issue for a multitude of different reasons you know, class-based biases, sure, but also, you know, crime. It's a multifaceted issue. 
But whenever, there's always like on the Vancouver subreddit, there's always somebody that's like, my dad used to work for the police force. And he said that most of the homeless people, or usually it's not that. It's usually it's like there's one anecdote. The homeless guy, he picked up his sign, he walked a block, and he got into his Ferrari and drove home to his mansion. I'm here to tell you, I'm not going to say that has never happened. But from living in a city with a large homeless population, um, and from, you know, living on planet Earth for 31 years now, that story does not pass the smell test. That is the story of somebody with an agenda who wants to sway you to their side as well. That's just my take on the subject. I'm not sure I buy the... the, the wealthy secretly wealthy homeless story I'm not saying it's never happened but I, but I saw a TV show where the guy he commuted from the suburbs pretended to be poor and begged all day I don't know look I just don't see it I don't see if if a person had other options that their number one choice of job would be Asking for money on the street. It seems like a demoralizing task. You know what I mean? We have to take one and I'm very happy that we have uh, We have the option to take book of the dead. I will go back and look at the boss trap room here I just don't see a situation where people are like, you know Well, I have other options, but you know what really I think would fit me nicely is uh Getting ignored and yelled at and spat at and sit outside in the cold and rain all the time. To maybe make as much money as I could on a on a normal day at the office or something like that. That's why it doesn't pass the smell. Oh, no. That's why it doesn't pass the smell test for me personally. People, they're also of the opinion that, you know, it's a lazy way out. Dude, that's like the hardest job of all time. You know, when I see, uh, like, charity canvassers on the street, first, I very quickly concoct an excuse to not have to speak to them. I'm sorry, but it's the truth. You know, if I see them holding a sign, and then they're, they always say the same thing. They always go, whoa, nice shoes. I get it. <laughs> You're trying to establish a rapport. And then after I say thank you, you go, how do you feel about malaria? And you're already sunk. What he's it's I'm not pro malaria, but I got other things to do, okay? I get I don't think you're doing a bad thing, obviously, it's just kind of annoying. Either way. When I see people doing that job, I don't go, geez, I wish I could do that for my job. That job seems hard as heck. Constantly any job where you gotta talk to strangers all day and constantly deal with rejection? This sounds horrible. I'm sure you get desensitized past the point, but like Oh we're okay, we just lost our HP. That's okay, it's okay. Um I don't think you that's something you default to. The average person at least. Unless you you got no other options. But anyway, we're getting into some real stuff here. <laughs> It's always, it's a very hot issue in Vancouver. I remember when I was, in, so we have a new mayor, but we used to have this mayor. Um, and I moved to Vancouver in 2012. Apparently his 2010 campaign, his main campaign promise was to end homelessness by 2014, which is in hindsight, absolutely hilarious. I mean like, it's it's basically well it's like when you know Joe Biden said if we run or if we win the Democratic nomination in the presidency we're gonna cure cancer. It's like I I admire your noble aims, but you cannot in good conscience promise that. That's a very heady promise. If you do it, here's the thing: no sour grapes. I'm rooting for you, but you're like, come on, you can, it's a multifaceted issue. Plus, you're the mayor. You know you don't <laughs> with no if there's any. You know, local comp trollers or Reeves watching this, uh... I mean no disrespect, 
But as the mayor, there's not that much that you can do. You know, what, what's within your jurisdiction? You know, we got a huge, like, opioid crisis. It's a public health concern of the highest degree. What are you supposed to do if you're the mayor? Uh, presenting motion to raise property tax by 5% to eliminate all drugs. What are you supposed to do? There's nothing you can do as the mayor. You don't have that kind of power. Uh, permission to get $250,000 to create a festival where we eat deep-fried pickles. That's basically the best you can possibly do, and we come together as a community and... Don't hit me. I need this HP. That's all you can do. Not, maybe that's not all you can do. I'm kind of ignorant of the, the duties of a role in the jurisdiction as compared to, you know, a, a premier and a, the prime minister as well, but... Run. I'm just saying. It's a multifaceted issue. I can't believe... You know, to be honest, in 2010, I probably would have voted for him. I would have been like, you know, I don't think he's going to do it. I'm not an idiot, but let's see where this goes. If he's right, then, you know... <laughs> I didn't live here in 2010, so I didn't have the opportunity to vote for him, but... It's one of those things, it's like, you know, well, I don't want to be the reason the guy who's got the miracle cure for homelessness doesn't get in. But I, th I would like to think that even if he had lost, were this the situation where he had the secret, he would have told it to whoever won. Otherwise, that would make him a real piece of garbage, right? <laughs> if he was, I've got the secret, but I won't tell you unless I win. No, I understand that's not how that works. He's saying if he had the resources... And the elbow grease and a four-year mandate with city council backing him. He could enact a multitude of different measures that could make it happen. But it kind of sounds like he's like, I got the cure, but the only way I'm going to give you the vial is if you make me the mayor. Okay, so I am actually going to joker card, which is not a good move. The sensible move would have been to see if we got a deal with the devil. And then use it, but I'm kind of... Starved is not the right word, but I am eager, no, okay, we're okay, to get more offense as soon as possible. That's good. Thank you. That is also fine. I don't remember the trinket, though. Much like our, uh, our last run, damage is up to this point our single biggest concern. It must have been a decent trinket, because we did get the marbles, right? Maybe we got three bad trinkets and chose to pick none up. I do do that on occasion. Trinkets are pretty... You know, they're feast or famine. You get something amazing, or you get something that you're like, ah, it doesn't even matter that it exists. Should try that if I ever want to run for office, which I definitely cannot. Anytime you... You open your mouth, you say controversial things, whether you mean to or not. Oh, so you want to be the, uh, the Prime Minister, huh? Well, what about this clip from 2017, where you say food poisoning isn't real? I had food poisoning. Are you calling me a liar? I'd be, I Effective immediately, the Letourneau uh, campaign announced the suspension of its quest to become the Prime Minister of Canada. Please just give me a lobbying job. I can be an effective lobbyist behind closed doors. I cannot be the public-facing politician. But I'm telling you, if you're... Dude, okay, you know, next year, maybe you want to run for student council or, you know, alma mater society or something like that at your college or high school. Hit them with something like that. Hit them, hit them with something ridiculous. They'll never check. They'll just vote for you. If Just go and be like, okay, my name's Tim Robinson. I'm a student council nominee. President of student council. I'm running for president of the students council. I pledge, if elected, I will end detention during my tenure. There's no way between you and me you could ever do that. It doesn't make sense. How are you going to end detention? That's not... It's not something that's within your grasp. It's out of your jurisdiction. But when you say it, at that school assembly, kids are going to lose their mind. And they're going to vote for you 
Because even if what you're asking for is ridiculous and even impossible, it doesn't matter because everybody else is going to be like, I'm going to make sure the vending machines are 25 cents cheaper. They can't even do that to begin with. But at least your impossible promise is audacious and ambitious. <laughs> you're running on hope, okay? It's irrational. Lean into it. That's if you want to win. But I would never encourage you to run for student council. I was on it myself in sixth grade. Um, I was sick. We had a, basically a sociopath teacher in sixth grade. I was sick when they had like their second meeting. Um, literally sick from school. I was at home. The teacher held a public impeachment he hearing for me in class. I know you're like, good one. This is not a joke. Did happen. The class voted to impeach me because they're 12, so why wouldn't you? I would have voted the same. I, I, you know, I, you, know, you don't have the most tolerant viewpoints always when you're 12 years old. I was like, well, if you really wanted to be student council president, you just shouldn't have gotten sick. I was voted, uh, I was voted out of office and replaced. Very embarrassing. Basically, like, my teacher took out a hit on me. It's not, it was well beyond the role that he should have been taking as an educator. He's just a loser, basically. Like, as a, as a kid, you're like, he's mean. As an adult, you're like, no adult should ever act. It's like, it makes it worse. <laughs> it's not a situation where, like, you know, let me put it this way, okay? In second grade, I was having trouble learning how to tie my shoes. My second grade teacher, we were having a movie day in class. She was like, Ryan, privately, Ryan, you come outside. You don't get to come inside and watch the movie until you learn how to tie your shoes. At the time, I was like, she's mean. And there's some meanness there. But at the same time, it gave me a little kick into gear. I really wanted to watch the movie. It motivated me. And by, you know, the time, it probably felt like, you know, two hours. But, you know, when you're a kid, five minutes is like a lifetime. After like half an hour or so, I had my shoes relatively well figured out. I showed the teacher. She said, good job. You can come inside. Now that I'm older, I'm like, not mean. A little bit of tough love. Might get you in a, a, just the slightest bit of trouble now, but I doubt it. I think she did a good thing for me that day. This sixth grade teacher, you're like, no, no, no. You're just a total idiot. <laughs> Power tripping. For no reason. And, yeah, I, yeah, we, we don't have to go into it. I mean, he didn't do anything, like, gross. But I do remember, like... My favorite story of his is... The, well, there's a couple of, like, red flags that should really stand out to you. One is, you know, we had one uh, student in our class who was not as quick with the book smarts as the average student in class. And it's not his fault. You know, he it's a class of, like, 40 kids of all varying abilities. He was having trouble getting his work done on time. And the teacher was like, hey class, I've got an announcement. David didn't do his work fast enough, so now nobody gets to go out for recess. You should not need any prompting or guiding to figure out why this is not the way that a teacher should handle this issue. <laughs> you have... A, you're punishing 30 people for the actions of one. B, you're just railroading that kid. We were gonna have a pizza party. But David didn't finish his homework. That's not fair. Now, could you make it so maybe David doesn't get to go out for recess because David didn't finish his work? Yeah, but... I mean, that would be a lot better, although still probably not great, unless you use that time to maybe, you know, you're like, David, you don't get to go out for recess, but hey, we're going to do some one-on-one -on -one work to figure out, like, how we can make this work for you. You know, that's your responsibility as an educator. But instead, he was just like, I got to motivate this kid to do his work. I don't know what to do. I don't know. Just use 30 other kids as collateral and, like, completely ruin his, uh, any social credibility he had in class. But that's not even the worst story. My favorite is one time we had like a, it was a multiplication test. And, um, 
you had to show your work to get full marks, which as far as I'm concerned is very stupid. Um, especially in an era before you could have like a portable calculator on your phone. Here's the thing. I, I still to this day, I sort of don't understand showing your work on addition, multiplication, etc, etc. The thing is, you know, if you ask a kid, you're doing like triple digit by double digit multiplication. If you ask a kid like, hey, what's, uh, you know, 13 times 221. If they write down the wrong answer, or sorry, let me rephrase. If they write down the wrong answer, what do you think the odds are they just guessed, you know? Maybe they had a calculator in their pocket or something like that. That's, you know, kind of on you to see it. Why should they have to write, you know, if they've got the formula committed to memory, why do they have to write it out? That's my two cents on that subject. For, for stuff like proofs, yes, I understand. Because the, the, I mean, the, in that case, showing your work is the actual knowledgeable part of it. Um, but anyway, despite that, I showed my work because, you know, you got to play ball. <laughs> but one of my uh, friends at the time, who, you know, might have some uh, issues of his own that are not for me to, to judge or, or dredge up. Because in this story, he's like 12 years old. He didn't show his work. He failed the math test despite getting, you know, n maybe not every answer correct, but despite getting most of the answers correct. He failed it because he didn't show his work. And he started crying, and he got into an argument with the teacher. was like, I don't understand how you could possibly, like, you know, torpedo my grade when I know what I'm doing. I just, you know, basically due to a clerical issue, you're going to screw me over on this one. And there's points on both sides, you know? The thing is, the teacher, they might have a mandate from the from the province to be like, hey, as part of the new curriculum, all kids have to show their work. But whatever, what you don't do is engage the 12-year-old child in an argument. You're the adult. But instead, while the whole class listened for 45 minutes, they argued back and forth about it. Just the two of them, while the rest of the class listened on. It's just, as a person who did teach for a year, it's a horrifying story. How did you let that happen? That instead of teaching a class, it became you and one 12 year old arguing. And then, my, admittedly, my acquaintance, who's very upset, but teacher was like, I want you to stay here and think about what you've done. And then the teacher took the other 30 kids out of class and we went into like the hallway and did our lesson there while he cried inside. <laughs> Which is a little hilarious. But also, like, man, you really lost the room. <laughs> That's bad. I think, you know, it's it's harder to be a teacher than people give you credit for. You know, different people are good at different things when it comes to teaching. I am good at teaching uh, kids who are well-behaved and motivated. But that's not hard. If a kid is poorly behaved, unmotivated, and especially like if they're young, like, you know, first grade, second grade, there's no chance. My demeanor does not appeal to, you know, a, a seven-year-old child. Listen to this voice. As soon as it, it's like kryptonite for a seven-year-old. They can't listen to it for more than two seconds without going like, Aah! There's nothing I can do about that. But this guy, Man, he sucked. Anyway, as the of all the teachers I've had, including university professors, is by far the worst. The only other time I've been, I, I can even think that comes close, is like in my senior year of university. Dude, I haven't thought about this story in a long time. In my senior year of university, in my final semester, I had two classes. That you, I mean, it's not like I didn't put myself into a bad situation. It's just the way it is, right? I had to pass these classes in order to graduate because they're for my major. Um, so I did the work, but these are classes where, you know, like one final paper might be worth like, you know, 75% or 50% of your grade. Um, so f one of the classes was totally fine. Not an issue at all. Made a beautiful PowerPoint for my, you know, 45-minute seminar. Went amazingly. 
felt like I was doing a TED talk, probably was very pretentious. But it got the job done. This is when TED talks were still well liked. <laughs> they were still new on the scene. Another class, it was like we had to write like a scientific journal review. I forget the exact specifics. Anyway, I wrote it and handed it in. And then like closing into the, you know, finals date, the professor emailed me and he was like, hey, just so you know, because you didn't hand in, you know, this project, you'll probably fail the class. And I was like, excuse me, sir. Uh, what? I did hand it in. So I'm hoping uh, that, you know, you you haven't lost it and that you could find it because, uh, you know, I submitted it in advance of the due date. And he was like, well, I don't know. I don't make a history of losing things, so I'm a little bit skeptical of what you're saying. But at the same time, uh, you know, I suppose anything can happen and blah, blah, blah. You know, I'll keep my eyes out. And then, like, he ghosted me for like a week. I wrote the final exam and he came in and he was like, hey, can I speak to you outside? And I was like, sure. And he's like, hey, so just so you know, I found the paper. I was relieved. And you know, everybody's human. But I was also like, wow, dude. <laughs> At least privately. I mean, like, to send a student an email that's like, hey, because you didn't hand this in, you'll probably fail. That's, I honestly, I would appreciate it. Because it gives you an opportunity. If he hadn't done that, I don't know. I might have just failed the class and only noticed when I got my transcript or something. But, um, you know, it gives you the chance to be like, well, actually, I did hand it in. I think what he thought is I'm going to send this kid this email, and then when he hits me with an excuse, I'm going to shut him down. And my excuse was, uh, you lost it. And he went, mm, I don't think so, partner. Nice try. I've been in this business a long time. Oh, I bet you think I was born yesterday. Hit me with an excuse like that. Well, you think I am some kind of idiot? I would... Lose a piece of paper? Something that could easily blow out the window if, uh, you know, a gust of wind came through my office when I was in the bathroom? Absolutely not. I'm in control of all aspects of the universe at all times. Anyway, it all got sorted out, but that was a stressful time. I guess you, you could say I almost... I, I ran into that close call because of another clerical error. <laughs> This, it's it's true, by the way. I know you're going to be like, this story sounds weird. What, why does it sound weird? It sounds weird because I was probably part of the last uh, cohort to go to college when you still submitted papers uh, exclusively in meat space instead of putting them to a Dropbox. No joke, when I went back to school to learn programming, it took me, like, at least an hour to figure out how to use the class Dropbox when I had to submit a project. I was like, what the heck's going on here? What, what, what one of these Java files do I put in? What do I zip up? Anyway. Got it all sorted. I am proud to say in my scholastic life, I have never failed a single class. Quit bragging? Okay. Now, let me tell you come within a few percent in a couple of classes in college and I did drop one class that I probably would have failed and then I took it the next year and did a lot better <laughs> but I've still got a spotless record kind of there's there's one withdrawal on my transcript didn't hold me back from teaching in South Korea apparently they did not care that much that I took uh, molecular genetics 1.5 times. Which is fair. Not much of what we learned in those laboratories uh, had much carryover with teaching English as a second language in South, South Korea. We weren't talking too much about genotypes, phenotypes, codons, and etc. and whatnots. This is the slowest fast run we've had in a long time like please with three luck i'm begging you a tears upgrade oh it would bring the house down everything else is fine i've enjoyed story time mostly because i'm the one who gets to talk um but this 11 rate of fire eight damage it's just not quite where you want to be it's not off by a ton Ooh. 
But you would like to be... That was bad. I got cold feet there. You would like to be just a little bit better off, obviously. That's not gonna help. This is usually a pretty easy room if you have piercing shots. I'll definitely take it. Actually, you know, like all these tiny rooms tend not to be too bad with piercing shots and enough damage. It didn't go so hot. What is up with my physique right now? Got an extremely wide diaphragm. <laughs> Every once in a while, Isaac can still surprise you with the the cosmetics. Remember when they added the vanity to the game? If you want to talk about an underutilized piece of machinery. I remember I used it a couple of times when it first came out and went, Whoa, what is this? This is crazy. And I may have broken my game with it. And then I was like, I don't understand what this is. I don't get it. And somebody was like, oh, it's just cosmetics. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, never again will I use this then. So we got to not get hit anymore. Okay, good start. Almost got hit immediately following that. Our main problem is not a lack of damage. That sucks. Is honestly, I, in my heart of hearts, I believe the problem is inside of my brain is a little switch that says, look at those tears. You should kill enemies a lot faster than you are. And that's not fair. Because we have a HUD that tells us how we're doing. But I will say... I don't disagree with myself. <laughs> I am like, look at these tears. We should be killing enemies a lot faster. This is real bad. I think we're actually gonna die. That's that's not pretending. It's not pretending. Fair enough, honestly. I that's the first time I've lost as a non-keeper lost character in a long time. We deserved it. We were playing a little lazy on the chest, but. Also a pretty unremarkable run to begin with, but great stories. For now, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. If you did, click the like button. It's a great deal. Of course, subscribe if you want to see more in the future. For now, thanks for watching. I will see you next time. See ya!